but he only has three catches in the game. And even the even the tight ends, Kyle Rudolph, one catch in the game. Uh, Irv Smith, two catches for four yards. So I think Thielen was just part of that whole kind of meltdown on offense that was precipitated by the offensive line protection issues and Cousins pressured on 58% of his of his dropbacks. And, and even when he wasn't pressured, it was kind of like last year where he was seeing the, the, the pressure coming when it wasn't and he was bouncing passes. And it just, in that regard, it was alarming to me to see the performance of the offense and, and the quarterback and the offensive line. And I think this is a big challenge this week for Kevin Stefanski, for Gary Kubiak, for Rick Dennison, the, the coaching staff, to get things back on track quickly for the Chicago team that they've had trouble with, that have rushed the passer well against them. And they better figure out a way to block Camille, Khalil Mack and double-team him and not have Riley Reef singled up on him because that, that's what happened with Zadaria Smith and Khalil Mack is, is that type of player, but better. <laughs> so, and even though Khalil Mack has had for him somewhat of a down season, he's only got eight and a half sacks. He's been a Viking wrecker. We know that. And so I think that's the big challenge this week, handle him, get some running game going and, and get that offense back on track, make some plays, get a lead and then be able to pull your stars, get a two touchdown lead, pull your stars in the second half like the Bears did to them last year in the season finale. <laughs> right, yeah, that, that would be the ideal. That's what I think they need to have happen. Uh, and we'll see if they're capable of pulling that off. Uh, the uh, Khalil Mack trade seemed to alter the power structure in the NFC North when it happened. The Bears immediately became contenders. They won the division. Uh, they go to the playoffs. They could have won a playoff game if their kicker had done his job. Now, as you look at it, do you think the Bears – do you think, still think it was a great deal for the Bears, or are the Raiders going to end up looking better about this deal just because Mac hasn't been able to lift the entire franchise that we did last year, and the Raiders did get some assets out of it? They, they did, and I think one of them was Josh Jacobs, who may be yep. the offensive rookie of the year. Right. And, and so a 1,000-yard thousand rusher uh, for the Raiders, and and – Perhaps down the road that'll happen. Certainly the short-term returns were, were bad and damaged the Raiders last year significantly. That They had, I think, 14 sacks on the season. It was a disaster. But they seem to be building it back, even though the second half of the season has been bad in, in Oakland. But uh, Khalil Mack, yeah, he's, he's still got eight, eight and a half sacks, five forced fumbles, 46 tackles. They still make the plays. Right. But hasn't had quite the impact last year where he had double-digit sacks and and just was a, a phenomenal, phenomenal player out there, which I, I still think he is that type of player. And and so we'll see how, how it all pans out with the trades and, and how the Raiders use all those picks. And sometimes you just have to wait several years to really analyze a trade such as that and, and see. And it may turn out to be more of an even type of trade. I'm not sure the Raiders are, will ever be able to say, we got the best of the Bears. <laughs> but but I think that that... It, it may end up evening out a little bit more as time goes on because Khalil Mack is such a special talent. And you just, you just don't trade away those kind of players. You don't trade away defensive player of the year type guys. It's just, I thought it was a ridiculous trade at the time. And I still do. What do you make of what's happened in Chicago this year? Uh, they have, you know, they get rid of Jordan Howard. They're price placed into David Montgomery. Montgomery has not really been very dynamic for them. Uh, Trubisky seems to have gone backwards uh, Allen Robinson is still a really good player, but they, the passing game hasn't been as evolved as you would expect it to be. And, you know, I mean, the offense really went in the tank. I think they're like 30th in yards gained this year. What do you think happened there? Well, I think a couple of things. I think, first of all, you look at the quarterback and Mitchell Trubisky, and, and last year he was, I think, 15th or 16th in the league. Uh, passing efficiency was 95.4, 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions this year. 17 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. He's down to 28th in the league with an 82.9 rating. And ratings are, can be deceptive, but I think it does tell the story to a certain extent. His rushing yards are significantly down from where they were last year. He's got 192 yards rushing. I think he was over 400 yards last year, and that's where he really hurt the Vikings, for example. So I start with Trubisky. I also say injuries have had a big effect on that team. You take Trey Burton, a really good tight end out of the mix, you take defensively Akeem Hicks, who was great last year, and 
Uh, and also they've lost Trevathan and Roquan Smith. Both of the uh, inside linebackers on, are on IR. And, and so I just think there have been a lot of injuries that have hurt their playmakers on def- defense and playmaking ability. And I think it's really exemplified when you look at, at the plus-minus stat, the turnover ratio, which to me is the second most important stat in, in football after the final score. And the Bears last year were plus 12 for the season. And, and this year they're minus two. So that's, that's a significant difference in what's going on in terms of, of turnovers. Last year they had 27 interceptions, and I think it led the league, and 50 sacks. And this year they've got eight interceptions and only 32 sacks. So you look at those numbers, you say, okay, the defense is not as dominant. The quarterback's not as dominant. We've had injuries. And I think that's why they're seven and eight to me. Yeah, makes sense. Hey, let's get into Antonio Brown. Uh, the Saints worked him out. That's a very interesting development here as the playoffs approach. First, though, tell us about B-52 Burgers and Brew, where you do your own show. Yeah, definitely. And, and B-52 Burgers and Brew had our uh, WCCO radio, News Talk A3O, Monday Night Purple show. Last night was a Thursday night show because of Christmas week and the Monday night game. And we had Mackenzie Alexander and Amir Abdullah on the show to – uh, really interesting guys and and uh, did a great job on the show. Uh, had a lot of fun out at B-52. Full house last night and, and B-52 Burgers and Brew in Invergrove Heights host Monday Night Purple Show next Monday at 6 o'clock, or actually 5.30 next Monday, a little bit earlier because of Timberwolves basketball. We'll have Eric Hendricks, the Vikings leading tackler, uh, who may or may not play in this game, but Regardless, he's had a great season, 110 tackles, should have made the Pro Bowl, has 12 passes defensed that lead the linebackers. Pro Football Focus ranks him the number one linebacker in the league. So Eric Hendricks will be our guest along with B.C. Johnson, who has really had an excellent rookie season and doing a nice job as a number three receiver for the Vikings and started several games. So we'll have a great show next Monday night leading into the playoffs and then a playoff show on January 6th. But B-52 I encourage everyone to head over there, uh, Invergrove Heights in Lakeville, terrific menu, 25 varieties of burgers, great entrees and appetizers. They have Monday night specials and a fantastic Sunday brunch. So check out their website, b52burgersandbrew.com, and hope to see you there for Monday Night Purple. So the NFL is still planning on putting Antonio Brown on the commissioner's exempt list until his investigation is complete, and yet... The Saints are working them out this week. Uh, you know, you and I have talked about Tyreek Hill and other problematic players before, other criminal players before. What would your view of Antonio Brown be as, as an NFL general manager, given all the baggage he carries? I, I think the guy's an idiot, personally. Yeah. And I, I think he, I would be very apprehensive about ever signing him just because of, of the the diva personality that he brings is similar to the way I feel about Odell Beckham Jr. And, and, and Le'Veon Bell to a certain extent. I think, I think all three of those guys uh, can, can be, they're not team focused. I don't believe, I think they're, they're me guys. And I think that Antonio is right at the top of that list right, right now with everything that's gone on. And I don't really understand the Saints bringing him in to work him out right now because I don't think the league would would even let him sign with the Saints. I think they would they would force him on that exempt list and and until they finish their investigation of of, of the allegations against him uh, for the sexual assault and everything that's going on allegedly. So I, I think that I don't really understand what what they're what Sean Payton is doing with this situation and because I, there's just no way that he's going to hit the field this season. It would shock me if the if the NFL let him play and which uh, the guy is certainly a talent. He's a quality player. He, he's also north of 30 years old now, and I'm just not sure how much attraction he's going to have the teams on the open market once he is ever cleared by the NFL, which I think will happen eventually. And if he, and if he does get cleared, uh, I, I think teams would still, as I said, be apprehensive about signing him because of the baggage that he brings and, and just the, the non team guy that he is and, Everything that happened in Pittsburgh and Oakland and New England, it's just, it's got disaster written all over it. And so kind of bizarre that, that the Saints do that at this time of year 
when when they're heading towards the playoffs. Yeah, I've you know it's funny. I've always uh, loved the way Sean Payton's teams play, and never really liked Sean Payton a whole lot. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like he's he's a guy who will do anything to win. Um, and but you know, but you know, it's always felt I've always felt like Breeze was a classy guy, and I love the way New Orleans embraces the Saints. I love the atmosphere at the games, but. Uh, this does, I guess, if you were going to tell me a coach is going to bring AB in at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Sean Payton. Yeah, yeah, I guess, or or Belichick, the same. or Belichick. Win yes, he's cost. right there, and and he and he already did that. Yep, <laughs> and let him go. So, yeah, it's just kind of bizarre. And, and as I said, until these allegations are fully investigated and vetted by the league and and by the criminal court system or whatever or the civil court or civil trial, whatever's going to happen in this case, because he may be in, wind up being convicted of this thing or may end up being guilty. And, and so then he's definitely not going to hit the field. So I, I just think there's so many question marks at this point with Antonio Brown. And, and ultimately it comes down to two that, that he's just, he's just not a good guy. And, and, but as you said, I think Sean would do anything to try to win. And yeah, unfortunate situation, I would call it. Okay, let's wrap up the show with a look at the NFC playoff picture since we already know what teams are going to be involved, uh, at least for the most part. Uh, who do you think is the best of this lot? I, I think New Orleans is, is the, the number one team in my view. And I know that they've, they've laid some eggs this season and, and had against Atlanta, for example, when they were 8-1, Atlanta was 1-8. and eight, but, but that can happen. But to me, I think they're the most complete team offensively and defensively. I don't necessarily, I, I know that San Francisco's had a great season. I don't necessarily trust Garoppolo in his, in his playoff debut. And you look at what happened when the Saints played them in terms of San Francisco's dominant defense. Well, the Saints put up 46 points on them. But San Francisco put up 48 on the Saints in that unbelievable game. Yep. I, I don't see that happening again in the playoffs. And, and so I think the Saints are the, are the most complete team right now. I think Seattle was dangerous until they've just gotten so beat up and lose their top two running backs, and now their left tackle, Dwayne Brown. And It's just been too many injuries, I think, for, for Russell Wilson to overcome with that, that fragile offensive line. It's going to be tough, and, and uh, I, I do like Seattle still. I, I would not, not be surprised if they knock off San Francisco this week, even though everybody's figuring the 49ers are going to win. They wouldn't shock me if if the Seahawks win that game, green Bay is an interesting team. They're kind of dangerous uh, with the balance that they potentially have. I just don't know that Rogers has enough weapons other than Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones uh, to be able to, to beat a team such as new Orleans that, that brings so many weapons to the table. And, and so I, I think it's going to be a really interesting playoffs and, and for the Vikings, I think if they, if they bring their a game, they have a potential to, to knock these teams off. I just have a hard time seeing them have a, a sustained run of winning three road games to get to the Super Bowl uh, against teams such as New Orleans and Seattle or San Francisco and Green Bay. It, it, that, that's really a tall order to win that many games on the road. I saw that back in 87 when we beat uh, the Saints in New Orleans and then we beat the 49ers who were the number one seed and we got to Washington and and I think our guys were just worn out, and we almost we almost beat the Redskins in that game. Yeah. But it's just a really tough task. And I think what two teams have done in NFL history. I think the Giants did it once, the Packers did it once, and it, it's really tough to do. Or maybe the Steelers did it, but really tough to do when you have that kind of task to win all those road games. And but I like the Saints. I think I, I would predict them going into the playoffs as the team to emerge in the NFC. And We'll see about Baltimore in the AFC. I think that, again, you're talking about Lamar Jackson has not yet won a playoff game, and everybody's writing the Patriots off and saying they're third fiddle to Baltimore and Kansas City. Don't be so quick <laughs> to eliminate the Patriots when you're talking about Belichick and Brady come playoff time. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. I think uh, there's such, such balance. I think the Ravens are the best team, but as you said, Lamar Jackson hasn't won a playoff game yet. And so, I don't know, it's going to be fascinating. It always is. Well, I guess we have to pick this game. Uh, my last two picks were horrible. I thought they had a chance of losing in San Diego, and they won big, and I thought they beat the Packers at home, and they lost. So I am, I am lost, uh, but I will – 
Boy, I don't know how to pick this one, Jeff. I don't know who's going to play. I don't know what the emotions are going to be like in the Vikings 